my name is Felix Geisendorfer, and I'm a software engineer at Datadog, where I work on continuous profiling as a product. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about how to win frames and influence pointers. Uh, some of this presentation is going to be fun, low-level things, like the stuff you see on the slides. But don't worry, I arranged it nicely. The first part is going to be interesting practical sense. And then if you don't want the low-level stuff, you can leave for lunch early and skip the queues. Um, but yeah, the low-level stuff is one part of the goal of this talk. But my main goal is actually to get you excited about what I consider to be uh, one of Go's most underrated killer features. And what I'm talking about is the execution tracer in Go. I saw a lot of people who raised their hand saying they've used tracing or are interested in it, but execution tracing is a special kind of tracing. Uh, so has anybody here used Go tool trace or the uh, runtime slash trace package or net HTTP pprof tracing? OK, I see a few hands, but less hands. And that's good, because I think one of the reasons for not all the hands being up is that not everybody knows about it. So let's introduce it first. And for this, I was looking for a practical example that is not a toy example where you can tell I just made up some stuff to make it look cool, um, but also not so complicated that we're going to spend all our time on. And I got lucky in my search. Um, I was just looking through the standard library, and I was running the tests for the net HTTP package. And while I was doing this, I just looked at the time for this package to test the test run. It was 38 seconds. Does anybody here think that's fast? Raise your hands. OK. Anybody thinks that's slow? Awesome. Then you'll like this. Um, <laughs> I actually didn't know. Sometimes like a test does a lot of things, and it's reasonable to run slowly. Um, but I wanted to find out. And as I mentioned, I work on profiling. So I want to introduce you to one of my favorite profiling tools. Uh, it's the time utility. Um, some of you might have used it before. For those who haven't, it's either uh, a command line program or bash built in. Uh, and what it does is it runs your program and shows you how long it takes. OK, we already knew that, so that's nothing new here. But it also shows you how much CPU time you're using. And if we add up the user space time and the kernel time, we get to like nine seconds or something of CPU time. And the runtime here is 38 seconds. This is disappointing, because this whole point about these Go routines was to use our fancy multi-core systems. And we're clearly not doing that here, because our CPU time is much less than our wall time. It should be the other way around. And I don't know how many CPU cores my machine here has, but it's more than a fraction of one. So <laughs> clearly, this is not a limitation of my computer. Um, so the, then I started using the execution tracer to see what the problem is. Uh, and it's very easy to get started. The go test comment has a dash trace flag, which takes a file name. And then you can run go tool trace on that file name, and you get this little URL. And so you click on that URL, and you get this screen. Click this link that I've indicated here. There's other fun things to click, but we'll do that. And then you get a picture like this. And I'm not going to cover everything here, but uh, what you got here is these uh, lanes uh, called procs. Uh, you can think of each of these lanes as a little timeline uh, for one CPU core. And so it's not really a CPU core, but it's good enough for today. Uh, the colorful rectangles here are your Go routines as they are executing on those CPU cores. So what we can see here immediately, there are some stuff going on, sometimes even in parallel. But it's clearly not very dense. Like There's all these gaps of idle time in between where the program is not utilizing everything the machine has to offer. We want to compress that and make it much denser. So how do we do that? Um, I didn't know. I just started looking. I picked the first part of this trace and started to zoom in. And it gave me this picture. And this picture was interesting. Uh, I saw a bunch of Go routines executing, and then a period of idle time. A bunch of execution, idle time. And I was like, whoa, that looks interesting. So I looked at how long these idle periods are. And they're pretty much all around 250 milliseconds. And I was like, 250 milliseconds? That's an oddly specific value. Um, it's not a power of two. Uh, so what's going on here? So we can go deeper into this by basically zooming in to the first Go routine that starts running after this idle period of time. And when we do this, we see it much bigger here, blown up. We can click on it, and we can get a stack trace, which you can see on the bottom left here. And lo and behold, this Go routine, before it started running, was waiting on a time.sleep. <laughs> and uh, we have a whole stack trace, so we know more than that. We actually know who was calling time.sleep. And so when we do this, we get to some code. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe this when I found this. Uh, this code actually does something very useful. Um, 
This is a handwritten, maybe the first Go routine leak detector ever. There's now a library from Uber or something where you can make sure that when your test finishes, you leave no Go routines behind. So it's a good idea to do. Um, but yeah, it was like checking is there some Go routines left? And if not, well, I'll give it a lot of time to check again <laughs> and again. So it does it for two and a half seconds before it concludes, yeah, you have some Go routines that shouldn't be here. Um, I assume that when this was first written, it wasn't actually a problem. I think the scheduler probably changed a little bit and then the time.sleep actually started triggering. But previously, it was probably always uh, concluding that the Go routines had already gone. So I think this was an unfortunate accident. Um, anyway, it's very easy to fix. This is really good software engineering here, <laughs> which is run the for loop uh, 250 times more, and we sleep 250 times less. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, well, here's the result. Uh, on the top, you have the execution trace before this change, and on the bottom, you have the one after. And in these three areas that I've highlighted, you can see how a lot of the Go routines have now been packed more closely together, which means we made it more efficient. How efficient? 10 seconds. 25% uh, reduction uh, on the execution time for this test. I think that's pretty nice. And uh, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, the, the, the execution tracer's power here is that it's uh, the only tool that can do this. How else would you have solved this problem? You can go in every test and look through all the code and put printf statements there to time how long certain things are taking. You'll find it eventually, but it will be very labor intensive. Uh, this was literally end-to-end -to, -end to fix the bug was like less than 30 minutes. It took longer time to make the slides for it. Um, so this is the power of the execution tracer to me. And because it was such an easy patch to make, I, of course, sent it upstream, and it got merged because, well, it clearly made the tests faster. Um, and there's an opportunity here for you. If you come away from this talk and you're like, well, I don't have any interesting problems right now, as you've seen, this net HTTP page still has a lot of idle gaps in between, and somebody should probably look at what those are and if they should be there. Um, all right, so how does this work? How does the execution tracer's magic work? Uh, basically, it's a system that collects a lot of data about the execution of your Go programs. Uh, one area of data is data about the Go routine scheduler, which we're going to talk about more in a second. You can also get data from the CPU profiler, which some people might be more familiar with. It's a PPROF tooling, so the same data can flow into the execution traces. You get data from the garbage collector, which we're not going to talk much about today, but can also be super interesting. And you get this other data. And one thing I really like about the other data is you can import the runtime slash trace package, and you can annotate your execution traces with your own data. So you can put request IDs in there, user IDs. And then as you look through the data, you can actually scope your search to certain requests that were slow, uh, which is really cool. And you also get Go routine IDs, which you never get in Go. It's very exciting. Um, so let's talk about the scheduling events. Go routines can be in one of three states. They can be running on a CPU, or they can be off CPU, waiting for something to happen, essentially kind of sleeping, our time.sleep example with a sleeping state. Or they can be runnable, which means they've just been woken up, they're ready to run, but the scheduler has not yet found an uh, idle CPU core to schedule them on. Um, and basically, for a normal Go program, you want most of your time is on running and waiting. If you have a lot of time spent in runnable, that's very bad, because that means you essentially have scheduling latency from an oversubscribed system. You don't have enough CPU cores. Um, the execution tracer basically emits events for everything that's an arrow here, so all the state transitions. Uh, so if you're blocking from going from running to wait, you get a stack trace with this. If you go from running to preemption, uh, preemption is if the scheduler wants to run another Go routine, you don't want one Go routine to hog all your resources, then the scheduler sometimes does the preemption. Um, you get a stack trace. For the other ones, you don't need a stack trace because you're in an off CPU state, so there is no chance the Go routine stack trace has changed in between, so you just record that event. Um, and this is the bread and butter of the execution tracer. There's much more data in there, but once you understand this and that you have this information with Go routine IDs, you know that you can essentially use this uh, to draw a picture of what every Go routine in the system was doing over time, and there's nothing missing. You really get everything. It's really cool. Um, so why is this a big deal? You can tell I'm excited about it, but why should you be excited about it? Um, I would say it's a big deal because it can help solve a lot of interesting problems. Uh, Go programs uh, typically have much more Go routines than CPU cores. Uh, at C, I do a lot of profiling, so I look at data. I usually see thousands of Go routines, 10,000s. I sometimes see 100,000 or a million, then I get a little uncomfortable. But I always see a lot more Go routines than CPU cores, usually like 10, 100,000 times more Go routines. Um, this 
logically means that Go routines must spend most of their time off CPU, waiting for stuff to happen. And I think this is important and matters because tail latencies matter. Uh, they matter for user experience and they matter for distributed systems uh, in ways that we're not going to cover today. But uh, my connection here is that off CPU waits, is my claim, are causing many tail latency issues. It's maybe intuitive when you think about what your Go program does most of the time. It probably waits on a database. OK, that's maybe easy to instrument and fix by just putting some explicit instrumentation there. But it's all the unknown unknowns where you have no idea. And so I'll show you some real examples of this. Uh, here we have a uh, request, and you see a lane for every Go routine that was involved in this request. And this is data I just pulled from a production system uh, not, not too long ago. And um, this one Go routine here uh, that's using a futures package, whatever that is, uh, you can see there's this giant rectangle here, uh, that orange one, and that's a mutex contention. This Go routine was spending 376 milliseconds uh, on a mutex contention, and that is explaining why this was a really slow request. And you might argue, well, I have a mutex profiler, I can already see this. It's true, but I think I can actually never look at a mutex profile and know how much it actually impacts my, my latency. I have no idea. It's not contextualized. It's sample data. There's no Go routine IDs. There's no labels. Uh, and here you can actually see this with full clarity. And I find these examples very helpful uh, for optimizing latency. So here you could figure out how to mix this, maybe a read-write mutex or more granular mutex. There's ways to fix this. Um, here's another example, which I actually didn't so think was all that common, but we see it a lot at Datadog. Um, here's a transient CPU spike. You get these uh, in one or two ways. You either get a lot of requests coming in at the same time. This happens a lot if your uh, requests are sent by other computer programs. They like to maybe also use Go routines, spawn a bunch of requests, and hammer you with it. Uh, so that happens very often. Or another thing, how you can self-inflict this on yourself, is if you have a for loop that's spawning a lot of Go routines, and these Go routines are doing CPU intensive things, then you can get the same issue. Um, here we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Uh, we have this Go routine that initially spends 313 milliseconds in a select statement. When we go through that stack trace, we see it's actually waiting on a semaphore. I would assume that's some concurrency limiting mechanism, so we're waiting on a previous request to finish. Uh, we could actually click here, there's links, and we could find out which Go routine that was if we wanted to. Um, what we also see is that there's a garbage collection, this little yellow area above, that is a garbage collection cycle. And one thing we know from garbage collector is that it takes away 25% of your CPU cores while that thing is running. So one theory here, which I'm not going to prove to you, but it's maybe plausible, is that the GC took a lot of CPU away and we had to wait because the thing we were waiting on couldn't run. Um, the further evidence for that is the second part of this request, where it mostly turns pink, uh, called unscheduled here. That is the same as the runnable state I was talking about earlier. So this Go routine was trying to run for a staggering 1.62 seconds, and the scheduler was like, sorry, I'm busy. I can't help you. And again, there's a metric in the runtime metrics package. Uh, scheduling latency is actually a nice histogram, but it's really hard to contextualize that onto individual requests. And that's what the execution tracer can do. Um, so what's the catch? Why isn't everybody using this yet? Um, one problem that used to be the case uh, is that this had a lot of overhead. So here's a benchmark from the runtime where uh, two Go routines have a channel, and they just wake each other up over that channel back and forth. It's a channel ping pong. And it used to be that when you enable execution tracing uh, on such a program, you would see 700% overhead, maybe 1,000% overhead, uh, and so on. It's pretty bad. Luckily, this is a very artificial case. If you have a Go program that behaves like this, you probably have other problems as well. But um, I'm not going to argue it's a good thing. It's too much overhead. Because in real production applications, uh, the overhead was up to 20%. So it, it was a, a real issue that prevented people from using this in production all the time. Um, so this gets us to how to win frames and influence pointers. Um, at Datadog, we wanted to build some stuff to help people with these latency problems. And we had some ideas, but we didn't really know which ones were good ones. And instead of really investing a lot of time in proposal processes, which, as we heard yesterday, are not always easy to do, um, or instead of writing a lot of big um, attempts of doing this, 
uh, we decided to reach out to, in this case, Michael Brett, who works on the Go runtime team. And I had known him a little bit from some bug fixes uh, that were contributed earlier. And uh, we were just like, hey, we want to contribute stuff upstream to make Go observability better. Would you be interested? And he was. And uh, we met with him, Michael Nicek, and Austin Clements. And in that meeting, it became pretty clear that the Go team really likes this execution tracer. We already had some other ideas, but we're like, we don't care. Like, whatever makes Go observability better, we, we're interested in. And this now is a bi-weekly meeting that's actually public. If anybody is interested in runtime observability, uh, you can find this GitHub issue and join the discussions. So the first thing we set out was to fix the overhead problem. It was actually a known issue. And here's a, a CPU profile of that benchmark I was showing you earlier. And what you can see here is 93% of the time of this benchmark, uh, or 93% of the time of the execution tracer overhead, more specifically, was spent in runtime gen traceback. And that is the function that used to create stack traces in Go. Uh, that function no longer exists. The code has been refactored. But clearly, stack traces were the problem here. Um, so how can we make stack traces faster? Um, to explain this, we have to talk about stack unwinding for a second, but it's actually a really simple idea. You know function calls. You make them all the time. Stack unwinding is the opposite. You go, if main calls foo calls bar, you go from bar to foo to main. That's called stack unwinding, sometimes called stack walking. Nomenclature is a little messy, but uh, who cares? It's a really simple idea. The problem for a computer to actually do that is that each function allocates a certain amount of memory on the stack, usually for local variables and some other stuff. And that amount of memory varies depending on the function, how much code it has in it, in it what variables you have. And so to actually jump from frame to frame to frame, you need to know the frame size of each function. So as we can see here, there's a few different ones. And what we want to eventually collect is these red things here. These are the return addresses of the function that was calling us. And that eventually makes our stack trace. Uh, so how did the runtime used to do this? A um, very common way to do that, and that was also used by Go, was to essentially have these unwind tables where you map these program counters, which are addresses in your binary, and you map them to which function they belong to and what's the frame size of the function at this point in time. So to use this information, uh, this is pseudocode. The real thing is like a thousand-line monster, or used to be, but it's, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, but the most important thing here is you have a map that's mapping these program counters to the size of stack frame, and then you have a for loop that at some point in the for loop, you look up the current program counter, and you get the stack frame size, which allows you to jump to the previous stack frame. And there you find another return address, which is your program counter for the next iteration of the loop, and so you can keep doing that. But it turns out this map lookup is actually expensive. It's not as fast as a normal map lookup in Go. For various reasons, there was binary search involved. There was the decoding of variable size integers involved. So this part was actually a bottleneck. There were a few other ones. So how can we improve this? Um, it turns out we can improve this uh, by using frame pointers. Uh, frame pointers have been in Go for a very long time, and they're a very old idea. The idea is that the compiler emits some special code for every function call in the beginning, which Go also does for other reasons. And this code uh, is essentially pushing a pointer on the stack, and this pointer points to the previous stack frame. And then you have a CPU register that holds a pointer to the topmost pointer on the stack. And then you basically start unwinding by taking a, the base pointer register uh, on the bottom right here. Uh, you follow it to the first frame pointer, and then you follow all those frame pointers up. And now you don't need to know the frame sizes anymore. And you still can find the return PCs because the location of those is fixed. It's relative to where the frame pointer is sitting. Um, this is some pseudocode of how to do this. Um, the actual code was shown previously. Um, but the main point here is there's no map lookup anymore. All we're doing is pointer chasing. We're just following pointers. And this might look familiar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this I've been doing computer stuff for over 15 years. It was the first time I really had to use a linked list for something. <laughs> and surprisingly, that something was actually performance related, which most people would tell you maybe not to use linked lists for. Um, but here we go. Uh, if you're asking yourself if linked list is really the ideal data structure for, the, for this or not, the answer is no. There's another thing called shadow stacks, which I've experimented with. So this could actually even be made faster. But there's no point in it. At this point, you don't have an overhead problem if you're doing this. This is very fast. And um, to give you some relative sense, a, taking a stack trace used to take maybe 1,000 nanoseconds, one microsecond, and now it takes maybe 20 nanoseconds. So it's 50 times faster if you do this. And then it's not a problem. A Go routine switch from one Go routine to another is usually 200 uh, nanoseconds. So it's fast enough. Um, 
Here is the impact of this on execution tracing. The overhead from the previous benchmark went down from over 700% to 30%. It was about 25 times faster. And this was the total, the, the remaining overhead is not stack traces, it's other stuff the execution tracer does. Um, this was something I cooked up in like a week or two. I had like a prototype implementation of frame point unwinding, and I was like, great, which is going to contribute to this small patch upstream, and it's going to work. Uh, so I was very excited. Um, but, yeah, so this is me picture of being very excited, making money on top of frame pointers. <laughs> the reality was a little bit more like this. Um, the benchmark was running, and it was looking really good, but I was trying to run the tests. And the tests had a little argument with me. They were like, fast is one thing, but correct is another. So I had test failures uh, related to the stack traces just being incorrect, having different function names, functions missing, all kinds of stuff. But those were nice ones, because you could kind of think about those. Um, there were test failures where the uh, Go program was just completely blowing up, and you would get a crash, and there would be, uh, yeah, all your registers would be dumped out, and you're like, oh, what's going on? Um, and basically, the next three months of my life were laying in fetal position below my desk and uh, using debuggers in a vain attempt to, to get out of this. Um, and yeah, one, one of the first things I actually ran on was not a crash, it was an infinite loop. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but some manipulation of those frame pointers on the stack uh, led to a case where the frame pointers were pointing in a loop, and so the unwinding was stuck in an infinite loop. Lots of quality time figuring out why this was happening. Uh, the change was actually relatively simple. It's really just two lines of assembly being modified here. The rest is comments. Uh, but the journey to get from, I have an infinite loop in my little frame point or linked list traversal to, to this was, uh, was very interesting. Um, then we had another problem. We wanted to support this platform called ARM64, which is getting more and more popular these days. We had it kind of working on Intel, but on ARM64, just nothing was working. It was constantly failing and crashing. We were like, why is ARM64 so bad? Yeah, then I looked through the code and I found this comment to do. What about ARM64 frame point adjustment? <laughs> what to do about this? Um, this is the uh, part where we get into explaining the influencing pointers part. Um, so for this, you need to know that Go routines, uh, one of their main virtues is that they're lightweight. And one of the ways they achieve that is by starting with a very small stack, usually two kilobytes. And when that stack fills up because you use too much, Go, the Go runtime allocates a bigger stack, and it copies all your stack frames from the old stack to the new one. So that's great. That's how Go uh, makes Go routines so scalable. But what happens if you have a pointer on the stack that points to the stack itself? Um, this can happen if, in your normal Go program, if you create a pointer to a local variable that can create such a uh, self-referential stack pointer. Um, it can also happen with frame pointers. And the problem is, once you copy the data over, you actually have the, old, uh, the new stack pointing back to the old stack. And that's very bad, because the old stack is about to go away, which means it can either be overwritten with data from a new Go routine that's going to reuse it, maybe the memory gets unmapped and you're trying to access illegal memory, maybe the memory's still there and you get a stack trace out of it, but it's not the stack trace you should be getting because it's old frames that are no longer on the real Go routine. Um, yeah, lots of quality time spent debugging this one. Uh, the fix was actually done by Jerry Mui from the Go team, uh, and yeah, it was very interesting. It was basically forgotten to do this. One of the reasons is frame pointers were not load-bearing. They were on the runtime for a very long time, but they weren't used for anything. You actually paid a little cost. Every time you made a Go function call, you paid a little bit of overhead for these frame pointers, but you got nothing out of them unless you were using Linux Pro or something similar, like an external unwinder. Um, I could go on for another hour with all the issues that we ran into and how we fixed them, but I'll spare you because lunch is coming up. Um, and instead, <laughs> I will tell you the moral of the story, uh, which is the programmer's credo. We do these things not because they are easy, but because we thought they were going to be easy. I thought this was like one or two weeks, and I didn't expect to spend three or four months under my table, uh, together with my colleague who was under his table. Uh, There's two people under a table. Um, but the end result was eventually we got it into Go 121, and there's a recent blog post that actually um, put some numbers for context for current Go releases, we expect the overhead for execution traces to be 1% to 2%. And that's on the high end. Some applications see literally no measurable overhead. Uh, so that's pretty good to the point where you can just turn it on in production and not be too worried about it. Um, or so we thought. <laughs> 
we, we deployed Go121 to production. We have a very large fleet of Go services at Datadog. And at some point, some colleagues pinged us. They were like, we're getting these weird crashes every once in a while. Do you have any idea what's going on? We're like, oh no, this function on top there, that's the one we uh, committed upstream. And this was one of the most bizarre debugging adventures. I, my colleague Nick actually did most of the work on this one. Um, but long story short, uh, here this, we were back to this, uh, it was a compiler bug. Uh, on ARM64, the compiler had two instructions in the wrong order, and then if a Unix signal was arriving at just the point of time between those two instructions, and you had some values in your floating point registers, which were very often zero, in these very specific circumstances, the unwinding would fail because you have a corrupted stack. And so, yeah, the uh, compiler team luckily fixed this. There's a nice comment here. Uh, needs a test, but I'm not at all sure how we would actually do that, leaving for inspiration. <laughs> Um, I don't want to throw any shade here. The compiler team is really great, and it's very rare to find compiler bugs in Go. They're, they're doing a really amazing job, and uh, we were ha happy that they helped us fixing this particular issue. Um, so now execution tracing is fast and stable, and uh, that brings us to almost the end, a call to action. Um, start using this in production. One way to use it is to the net HTTP pprof package. Uh, there's many other ways to use it that I'm not going to cover today. Uh, you can use the Go tool trace to visualize your traces. Uh, the UI is a little clunky, but give it some time. Once you figure out the keyboard shortcuts, it's like a computer game with WASD and so on. You'll, you'll get there. Um, somebody's actually working on a nicer viewer, Dominic Conef, who's also doing Go static check, is uh, doing this project called Go Trace UI. Uh, so you should check this out, and if you like it, maybe donate, because he's trying to make a living as an open source developer. And uh, there's common line utilities. Here's one that turns an execution trace into a wall clock flame graph. And uh, there is libraries now. Uh, so as of, I think, Go 122, Michael Nietzsche put out some EXP trace code to actually parse execution traces. So you now have a nice library to actually get all this data and do cool stuff with it. So you could build tools yourself. You can try in the same package flight recording, which solves the problem that this execution tracer is a bit of a fire hose. In some cases, it can generate like 20 megabytes per second, so you might not want to capture all of this data. And if you happen to be interested in only slow request, what this thing can do is you write all the data into ring buffer, or well, that's what it does for you. And then when you see a slow request, you can go back in time. You can be like, give me the data from the ring buffer going back in the last couple seconds, and you get the data. So this is very cool. Um, and yeah, contribute to Go as well. I mentioned this earlier. Check for stuff that maybe you can do with this execution trace on Go. And who knows, maybe it will lead you to more contributions down the line. And this brings me to the end, where I want to say it takes a village. Like, I was working on some of this stuff, but uh, Michael Pratt and Michael Nicek from the Go Runtime team uh, did a lot of work on the execution trace on and reviewing all patches and guiding us through that process. Uh, my colleague Nick Ripley did a lot of stuff, and the other people listed here were also contributing either to the execution trace on channel, some of these patches, frame pointers, a uh, whole bunch of stuff. And I'm sure there's even more people. So it takes a lot of people, including the organizers of this conference. I want to thank them for giving me a chance to talk about this here. And um, that is it. Uh, this was my talk, How to Win Frames and Influence Pointers. Thank you so much. <laughs>